Hello friends, welcome to EPG Parchala. I am Gurleen Kaur and I am a practicing advocate at Delhi High Court. Today, we will be discussing regarding the module related to female prostitution and the law under the paper Women in Law for the Study of Women's Studies. Now, basically the objectives are divided into two categories. We will discuss the provisions relating to prostitution in the country in the form of Immoral Traffic Prevention Act 1956 and secondly we will be discussing the immoral trafficking which is related to the practice of Devdasis which is carried in tandem not only as a religious practice but it is closely related to prostitution which is being perpetuated in society right now. So our main objective is to learn the legal provisions and what is being done to combat and regulate such prostitution in the country, whether it is part of trafficking under the Immoral Traffic Prevention Act and when it is a part of a religious practice under the Devdasi Act. Now the Immoral Traffic Prevention Act. Basically, prostitution is regarded as the world's oldest profession and it is considered as the worst form of exploitation to which any woman can be subjected to. Basically, a woman is then recognized as inferior to men in the society, one who is brought into existence only as a sex object and as an outlet for serving a man's baser primal needs. Basically, prostitution then takes two forms. Women who are those who are forced into the profession because of their condition. Now, this condition can be social or economic, such as destitutes, women who are suffering from matrimonial failures, financial reasons or basically an inherent desire to lead an easy life. The second form is the one which is considered as the one which is perpetuating this profession and not letting those get out of this vicious circle. Basically, the generations are not able to break through this barrier. Now, these are the ones who consider prostitution as an ancestral profession. For them, it is heredity. So if a woman, whether she was forced into the profession or whether it was considered heredity for her, the moment she's put into the former category of it being an ancestral profession, she's as it is subjected to ensure that she has a girl child who will perpetuate this practice or she will have to adopt a girl child for this profession. So this is something which ensures that this practice will be carried on the decades for come and it keeps continuing on for the next generations. Legal Regulation of Prostitution Article 23 of our constitution prohibits traffic in human beings and begar and other similar forms of forced labor. In 1950, the government of India ratified the International Convention for the Suppression of Immoral Traffic in Persons and the Exploitation of the Prostitution of Others. In 1956, India passed the Suppression of Immoral Traffic in Women and Girls Act. 1956 which came to be known as the Sita. Now this was the Sita which was then amended resulting in the Immoral Traffic Prevention Act which is PETA. The act only discusses trafficking in relating to prostitution and not for the purposes of domestic labor, organ harvesting, child labor etc. So basically what the act controls is trafficking and sexual exploitation when it covers only for these final purposes. So any sort of trafficking of humans or forced labor which is as such prohibited by article 23 of the constitution when it is done for other purposes than for prostitution that is not covered under this act. PETA is basically only concerned with those cases of trafficking of women or children or other beings for the purposes of prostitution. The Immoral Traffic Prevention Act punishes trafficking and sexual exploitation which is only for commercial purposes. So basically when prostitution is done by a person's own accord or they willingly enter the profession that is not something which is uh, prohibited by the act. While prostitution is an offence, practising it in a brothel or within 200 metres of any public place is illegal. Now this takes a very important turn because public place under the Act includes all sorts of hospitals, charitable institutions, religious places of worship. So having a brothel within 200 metres of a public place is virtually impossible and that is what is rendered illegal by the Act. 
one of the important changes which were brought in by the act was the definition of the term prostitution the act started using prostitution by the using of the term person so that broadened the scope of the act basically it brought within its purview not only women but also boys men transgenders and also the coty workers who were involved in this whole basically the act not only declares being a prostitute as illegal when one is forced into it for commercial purposes but also punishes those who own such an establishment or who are living of the earnings of a prostitute the act punishes a person if they procure induce or take away a child under the age of 18 years for such purposes so basically the act is not only bringing in you know uh, not only the process of eliciting customers or seducing them but also this very stage when a person is trafficked it punishes all the stages such as recruiting the person for prostitution transporting transferring harboring or receiving such persons for prostitution and when a minor is involved that is a person below the age of 18 years the act becomes more stringent in its application the major lacuna in this act is basically thus rendered around this whole process of involving different stages which follow a person being trafficked for prostitution the major lacuna in the act is that trafficking only for the purpose of prostitution and not when it is done for bonded labor organ trade domestic labor slavery etc therefore a comprehensive legislation is required to tackle the issue of trafficking for all purposes and not just prostitution also the term sexual exploitation and commercial purposes have not been defined by the act so that is basically open to interpretation by the person also when prostitution is carried on by a person's own accord for their own profit but within a public place of 200 meters then that renders it illegal so this is basically something which conflicts the very purpose of the act the act legalizes prostitution when you do it of your own accord but basically doing it within 200 meters of a public place is virtually impossible so you are rendered prohibited from practicing a profession even if you want to enter into it willingly therefore this is the commercial aspect of prostitution which is declared illegal but it lacks clarity you know on whether prostitution ought to be a legitimate way of earning a living and if the person enters or stays in the profession out of choice and is not forced into it now the act penalizes any person who visits a brothel for the purpose of sexual exploitation of a traffic victim now it would be very difficult for a person visiting a brothel to distinguish between a person who's trafficked and who's non trafficked basically a person who's entered the profession of their own accord and the one who's forced into it which is critical to this act further you can you know i can make you understand with the help of the experience of sweden basically where a similar provision was followed wherein the customers were punished for having uh, sexual relations with a traffic person so when the clients of the sex workers are rendered punishable in the law it moves a flesh trade underground which is what happened in sweden which makes it even more difficult to be regulated and then that spins a further vicious circle of further exploitation of women now the rank of special police officer who was set to enforce the act now that's been reduced from the level of inspector to that of a sub inspector which increases the probability of harassment by the workers also there is a need to broaden the pool of trained officers who deal with such cases of prostitution under the act also the act expands the police power to prevent trafficking but at the same time efforts to where there's a probability that such sex workers might be abused during such raids or there's verbal physical sexual harassment that has been prevented through a mandatory requirement of two female police officers who have to be present during such a search also interrogation of women and girls has to be undertaken by a female police officer in the presence of a female member of a recognized welfare organization additionally the act mandates rehabilitation of such prostitutes in protective homes shelters or reformatories where education and living facilities are all to be provided now an important distinction is what we need to consider when we discuss about peta and ceta under ceta adulthood was defined as a person who was of 21 years of age uh, so pursuant to this any adult woman who was prosecuted for soliciting or for engaging in prostitution should be tried 
and if she was convicted she she was to be sent to a protective institution whereas a girl below the age of 21 years in a similar situation would be immediately sent to a protective home or institution for rehabilitation now this distinction was only for the victims and not for the exploitators however with the peta coming in force now three categories are made and that is the child minor and major so basically any person below the age of 16 was categorized as a child minor would be any person between the age of 16 and 18 and major would be anyone above the age of 18 years the imprisonment for exploiting such children or minors was also increased to more severe under the act with a minimum of 7 years up to 10 years along with a fine further the act reverses the burden of proof for adults who are required to prove their innocence especially in case of children and minors wherein there is a presumption of innocence now the offence of procuring anyone for the purpose of prostitution is punishable with rigorous imprisonment of 7 to 14 years in case of minors and 7 to life in case of child which is in consonance with the legislative intent to create a deterrent effect. However, these provisions are effectively made weak because of the wide discretionary powers which are provided to the court to deduce the term of imprisonment. So basically when offences such as seducing or detaining a person for the purpose of prostitution is involved, the court can even give out a sentence of 7 years minimum, below the 7 years minimum basically. So the discretionary powers of the court to reduce this level of minimum 7 years has led to a lot of obstacles in the effective imp implementation of the act. Further, this combined with the lenient treatment of persons involved in certain offences such as seducing and detaining a person for prostitution has reduce the deterrent effect which, which the law was supposed to provide. And even if the women somehow managed to escape their captors, they just fall in prey to kidnappers, abductors and officials who are involved in the prostitution racket. Do not have the fear of being caught or even if they are, there is a probability that they will be left off on a very lenient jail term. The act raises another presumption with regard to children found in brothels of having been detained for prostitution which is rebuttable by proof to the contrary. In Gaurav Jan versus Union of India, the apex court observed that children of prostitutes should not be permitted to live in the inferno and desirable surroundings of prostitutes' homes. And there is an urgent need to rescue and rehabilitate prostitutes and their children so that they break out of this vicious circle. The court legitimized the children of prostitutes so they won't face the social stigma nor they are ostracized from the society which ensures that they are able to progress and live a dignified life. On the basis of the directions of the court, the committee on prostitution, child prostitutes and children of prostitutes and plan of action to combat trafficking and commercial sex exploitation of women and children was constituted. Dev Dasi Prohibition of Dedication Act now in South India, a Devdasi was a virgin girl dedicated to worship and service of a deity or a temple for the rest of her life. Now this practice ensured that Devdasis enjoyed a very uh, sustainable lifestyle, but one where they were given social recognition and order in society. Under the Devdasi Act, in South India, basically in the states of Karnataka, Andhra Pradesh and Tamil Nadu, a Devdasi was a virgin girl who was dedicated for service and worship to the deity of a temple for the rest of her life. Basically, when a woman or a girl who came onto her puberty, she was dedicated to the worship and married off to the deity of the temple. And a small ritualistic practice was done for the same. It was assumed that she is married for life and this would ensure that she not only lives in the temple, but she is considered as what is referred to Devdasis in Sanskrit, she was a slave of God. Now these women, they typically sang, danced, performed various rituals in these temples. But sexual activity was to be limited to one partner who was chosen by the Devdasi by her mother or grandmother who was considered to be you know, more practice in the profession. Since Devdasi is considered to be a hereditary profession, that is, it is carried on to a lot of generations. So the Devdasi has to ensure that either she has her own girl child or she adopts a girl child who will perpetuate this practice. And when that happens, it ensures that this vicious cycle will keep continuing on. 
Now, these Devdasis were not required to marry their sexual partners. It was only limited to carrying out an offspring. And these women had their own independent status in society. They had their own financial status. They had lands attached to the temple. So basically, they had a very good economic well-being. Also, these women, the partners that they chose as their sexual partner, they had no familial or other obligations towards them. They were completely financially independent of these partners and the ch children of such unions were regarded as the legitimate children of such women. And the man who was a part of, as her uh, sexual partner was not recognized at all. Now, traditionally, these women enjoyed a very privileged position in society, not only because they were economically and financially independent, but because of their temple association, they were generally treated as women who, you know, they were performing a religious obligation, something which, where, you know, she's dedicated to a deity, she is subservient to only God. And for that reason, she had a very elevated position in society. She was never looked down upon, never ostracized or socially excluded. And even her children were considered as legitimate children. So basically, that had a very huge impact on her position in society. They were not exploited because they were given respect and the children of such unions were also given respect. They were not treated as the way they are treated in present times where, you know, a prostitute's child is treated as a social outcast, ostracized by the society, prevented from entering into a dignified life. Now, what has happened is these women are treated as impure women. Dev Dasis in present times, these practices are being carried out in the smaller towns. So in those towns, they're still regarded as impure women, even though they're mandatorily required in the marriage ceremonies of upper caste Hindus because they're considered Akhand Sabhagivati, basically the bearers of good fortune. So these women are required to come to such marriage ceremonies. They're treated with respect. And, you know, this stigma attached with the whole practice is nullified for some time. But what was required as a very um, respectable practice in ancient times has now been relegated to the position of a mere sex worker who's dedicated to a temple, but she has chosen her own sexual partner. And the children who were recognized as legitimate and who, you know, no stigma was attached to them, now they are also something which is being, you know, eroded by the society. Further, when these women get out of these towns, they lose that connection with which they have with their communities. So whatever sense of belongingness and uh, respect they had within their own communities, that is somewhere lost. Today's present times, in which 1,000 to 10,000 girls are inducted into the practice each year, though, and now they're relegated to the position of sex work, which is hereditary. So either they have to involve their children in it, or they have to adopt a girl to perpetuate the whole process. Further, majority of these Devdasis, they belong to the Harijan caste, which is one of the lowest castes of the traditional Hindu caste system. These women are therefore marginalized not only for their gender, but also for caste and class associations, thus constituting the lowest rung of the societal ladder. Often, upper caste Hindu men influence such lower caste families to dedicate their daughters at Devdasis, and due to pressing economic needs and general perception related to a girl child as a burden on their parents, young girls belonging to these families are forced into the practice. A famous phrase that highlights the hypocrisy of the caste system in context of Devdasi sex workers is untouchable by day but touchable by night. Apart from being women from lower caste performing sex work, the Devdasis are also economically backward. Their social and economic status further perpetuates the system wherein Devdasis are compelled to work within the hereditary profession. This, in turn, has consequences for integration into mainstream society, lack of choices in terms of work, forced labor, and forced prostitution because of religious and economic factors, and rape and abuse by family and others. If Dasis were required to dedicate either their daughters or an adopted child, so this vicious circle keeps carrying on and even continues now. Further, Sections 370 and 370A, 372 of the IPC provide for sexual exploitation of women and minors. In regard 
to these provisions of the IPC, the Immoral Traffic Prevention Act works in tandem with it. So it provides rigorous imprisonment of not less than five years, which may extend to seven, and also liable for fine for a person who has trafficked a minor for such exploitation. Basically, what is needed is action in India to strengthen child protection and tackle the root cause of poverty, which drives such families to dedicate their daughters. Devdasis remain most common in the poorest towns of Karnataka and Andhra Pradesh, and it's an uphill battle to get women from the clutches of such a abhorrent practice. In 2006, the National Legal Service Authority in Bangalore lodged an awareness program for police and judges and they said that there were 250,000 girls who were detained in the Yalama and Khandova temples and because of the remoteness of such villages, there was a continuing rise in demand from organized traffickers who pay well for young girls to fill the brothels of India's cities. This social custom combined with economic pressures have pushed women into the system and the fact that not one of them married and most of them have children not only leaves them in a traumatized condition but also leaves the child forever stigmatized. Another major problem is with the Devdasi tradition that implicates the trafficking belt around the districts bordering Maharashtra and Karnataka from which such Devdasis are procured for the red light districts of Bombay, Delhi or other cities. And due to the economic and social status, a lot of them are dependent on their pimps who serve as protectors, making them even more vulnerable to trafficking. Such movement not only disconnects them from their own communities, but also forces them to live in unhygienic and dangerous conditions. This trafficking belt around the districts bordering Maharashtra and Karnataka has also not only affected the increase in the number of women trafficked for filling up the brothels in the major cities of the country, but another point of concern that is closely intertwined with this is the health hazard that sex work and trafficking pose. With the limited access to healthcare resources and lack of awareness, AIDS and other venereal diseases are highly prevalent within these Devdasi sex workers. This threat is accentuated when women are trafficked to larger cities due to lack of available space and exposure to larger populations. Trafficking of women separates them from their own communities, removing their most reliable support system. Although healthcare practices among such members are not necessarily efficacious, they are basically safety threats. And such safety threats take a more serious form when they are jeopardized by the very relationships such Devdasis had with their communities in which such practices were followed. Even amongst the Devdasis, repeated pregnancies and abortions starting at a very early age serve as a health threat for these young women. Moreover, their abortion practices are crude and dangerous. For example, a practice where a stick coated with oil and milk is inserted into the uterus of a woman is a common abortion practice. Therefore, a lack of available resources and education marks the descent of the Devdasi practice as a human rights issue. In a PIL filed by the Kerala-based NGO, SL Foundation, drawing the apex court's attention to how Dalit girls were being forced to become Dev Dasis in the Uttangi Mala Durga temple in Devanagari district of Karnataka, the PIL laid emphasis on the ineffective and lackluster approach of the state and police authorities of Karnataka, Andhra Pradesh, Maharashtra and Tamil Nadu while dealing with the rescue and rehabilitation of these girls. There was an inefficient utilization of funds and the bench of FMI Kalifula and SA Bobde directed all the state and union territories, especially of these states, to strictly enforce the provisions to check this undesired and unhealthy practice of forcing young girls to serve as Dev Dasis, describing the practice as an evil done to women who are then subjected to sexual exploitation and pushed into a life of prostitution. Also, any incidences of such Devdasi system being practiced in the Nut and Bay communities were to be brought to the notice of the court. Therefore, a lack of available resources and education marks the descent of the Devdasi practice. Perceptions of Devdasis are extremely dynamic and rooted in their religious status in society. Although they are ostracized and socially condemned for their work, their social status is not independent of their religious status. Even today, Devdasis are considered to be auspicious for marriage ceremonies within upper caste Hindus and therefore the presence is imperative on certain occasions. It is clear 
that the Dasis, by virtue of their profession and caste and class associations, are victims of human rights abuses and exploitation. They are often caught up in a self-perpetuating system that is fostered by tradition, lack of choice and social stigma, making it extremely hard for them to escape within these boundaries. Even those who are able to escape are pushed back due to social pressures or economic conditions. Now, relating to the landmark judgments given by the Supreme Court in this regard, that was in Vishaljeet versus Union of India, wherein the Supreme Court emphasized prostitution as a running sow which destroys all moral values, both in its causes and its legal effects. It emphasized on the necessity for the appropriate and drastic action to be taken in this regard to eliminate this practice for the coming century. The malignity is daily and the early threatening the community at large slowly but steadily making its roads inwards, leaving a track marked with broken hopes. Appropriate and drastic action is thus the hour of the need. The causes and evil effects are there for us to see. Further, in Gaurav Jan vs. Union of India, as explained on the Day Moral Traffic Act, these women are not only the ones who are exploited, even the children of such women are to be rescued and rehabilitated because they are treated as illegitimate, face social trigma, are ostracized by the society and moreover, they are never able to break out of this vicious circle. The court stepped in for this purpose to grant legitimacy to these children so that not only these children but also the coming generations were able to prevent the fate which was granted upon their mothers from progressing and living a dignified life. To conclude, countries worldwide accord legal sanction to prostitution which is not the norm in India. Basically, what is required and what is the need of the hours to be sensitized to this issue. A vital part of prostitution control is preventive. Now, how that is supposed to be done? Basically, the experience of countries like Sweden and countries where such prostitution was legalized has shown us the targeted in interventions such as, you know, providing counseling services, ensuring issuing of license to prostitutes, setting up vigilance cells for the monitoring and providing health care to such prostitutes would ensure that they are integrated into the system somehow, that you know they are not deprived of their basic human rights. Not only is it good from the side of the women who are involved in such profession voluntarily of course, but it also ensures that, that such you know profession is uh, what we would regard as something which is regulated by the society. And when it is regulated by society, we can control the outcomes. So basically, the main cold sore which is running through our society, the stigma which is, you know, attached to prostitution, that is something which we will be able to control to a certain extent. Now, regarding the healthcare provisions, we very well know that such prostitutes are relegated in society and denied basic health care. So the chances of eliminating prostitution are practically nil. So it's better that you provide, you know, health care, proper health care, where, wherein they are sensitized to AIDS and other venereal diseases to prevent its passing on to more larger populations because that is what happens when we deal with the Immoral Traffic Prevention Act or we deal with the Devdasi Act. In both the acts, we kind of uh, understand the linkage that both the uh, both these uh, concepts though they've been brought up very differently prostitution is very different from the way devdasis came as a concept but in the present time they are working in tandem with each other like the trafficking belt near maharashtra and karnataka which is formed through picking up devdasis from smaller towns and then transporting them to larger cities such as delhi bombay kolkata is basically perpetuating the system of forced labor and trafficking for prostitution. So, you know, the linkages of an ancient practice being turned into something which is violative of the very basic fundamental rights of women, of, you know, not being forced into some a profession which they don't want to, especially one in which they are treated as a social outcast and ostracized by the society, is something which needs to be dealt with and that too on a very urgent basis. 
Further, when you grant licenses to such prostitutes, you limit their number. There is a certain extent to which you will be able to constitute certain areas as red light areas, cordon off certain areas to influences to, you know, the minor population and also ensure that these licenses are not given away uh, indiscriminately. So, to some extent, you will be able to control the population. Also, these prostitutes need to be provided counselling. Now, there are two aspects. There is a physical and a mental welfare which is involved for every human being. So, the moment you give them counselling services, you ensure that their mental well-being is in tandem with their physical well-being. So, the whole uh, stigma which was attached to the prof uh, profession of prostitution, which many women enter voluntarily into, the, the negative consequences are somewhat diminished. Now, further, uh, state-led interventions in red light areas will accord some sort of legitimacy to the sex, wor sex worker, not only to the sex worker, but also her children who are regarded as illegitimate, who are prevented from enjoying a dignified life in society. They are not allowed to enter the basic mainstream of society. They are denied access to basic education, basic health care and even the communities that they belong to, they are ostracized by them because of who they are. And that is something which they are not able to control. The children of such sex workers, they cannot decide something which was just given to them by birth. So, we need to ensure that such children of such sex workers are not forced into the profession only for the reason that they are children of them. And also, the uncontrolled growth of AIDS in these pockets will be controlled to a very large extent. AIDS, also venereal diseases which are perpetuated when these women are transported from smaller areas to larger cities such as Delhi, Bombay or Kolkata where they are given access to a larger population. Also, as we noticed under the Devdasis, they have a lot of um, uh, what would be called very dangerous health practice. So, this is something which would be to a large extent controlled and regulated by the government. Thank you.